Thank you for the kind introduction. As uh, you have heard, my name is Sebastian, and I'm working as a research scientist in the Haldor Topsø company in Denmark in our R&D division. And uh, for the last four years, I've been uh, focusing my study on the methanol catalyst system. So uh, my talk today will be uh, on this particular system and, uh, and related to how it's working in the industry. So first, an outline for my talk today, I've decided to divide my talk into two parts, where the first, first part will be um, a scientific part, where I start out by introducing the methanol and the methanol catalyst system, and then I will go into details of how this catalyst system is working at the nano level. And in the second part of my talk, I will try to give you an overview of the history of Halder Topsø in relation to methanol catalyst, and, uh, and also how we're able to put our knowledge into uh, real commercial systems, which is working in the industry. So first, the first question which might pop up in your head is, why methanol? And um, methanol is a, is a really essential bulk chemical. It's the smallest of the alcohols, and it's really a platform material to produce a variety of different products which we all use in our everyday life. Uh, here is, for instance, in paints and plastics and silicones. But um, these are the applications which uh, is consuming the most methanol right now. But in the future, processes like the methanol to olefins, which we have here. Uh, oh, drip. Um, this is particularly big in China, or is expected to grow even further. Then we have the... Um, the methanol can be directly blended into your gasoline. You can form dimethyl ether by reacting two methanol molecules with each other, which can be used as a diesel-like fuel. You can make biodiesel, or you can turn methanol into regular gasoline and utilize the existing infrastructure. The world supply and demand of methanol in 2016 was uh, around 70 million tons, and uh, this uh, amount of methanol is forecast to actually exceed uh, 100 million tons already in 2020. So it's a market with a huge growth and, uh, and a potential to be even bigger than this right now. Industrially, methanol is produced from a synthesis gas composed of um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The reactions is uh, either the hydrogenation of CO2 to methanol and water, we have the direct hydrogenation of CO to methanol, and then we have the water gas shift reaction. So industrially methanol is produced in large scale plants and at temperatures between 2 and 300 degrees and, and pressure range between 50 and 100 bars. And uh, as I said, modern days uh, plants uh, are quite large and their capacities are actually exceeding 5,000 tons per day. Methanol is, or the methanol loop is uh, usually it's typically consisting of a boiling water reactor, uh, which is uh, an array of tubes. And in these tubes, the catalyst which is doing the chemistry is located. These catalyst is pressed into pellets and is uh, six times four millimeters in size, so they're actually they're, they're quite small. These pellets themselves is consisting of an agglomeration of uh, nano-sized crystals. There is some uh, key elements or some characteristics that makes a good methanol catalyst, and here there is four really essential parameters. First of all, you need a really good mechanical properties of your methanol catalyst. In the uh, oxidized state, or the fresh catalyst, it actually needs to withstand being dropped from 10 meters height when it's loaded into these huge boiling water reactors. But also in the activated state, the methanol catalyst needs to withstand the static force of the pressure drop over these type of reactors. Then, of course, you need a very selective catalyst uh, you don't want the catalyst to perform a variety of different side reactions as this will just make the distillation section larger and, uh, and more expensive in, uh, in the plants. So you want a very selective catalyst. 
then you want the catalyst to have a high activity throughout the lifetime because this catalyst will be in the plant and will be operating for two, three, or even four years. So you want a high, acti a high activity of the catalyst throughout the entire lifetime. And last but definitely not least, you will need a very, very efficient interaction between the components in your catalyst system. And uh, this will actually be the focus of, uh, of the first part of my talk today. So the typical industrial type methanol catalyst in the activated state consists of uh, metallic copper, you have zinc oxide, and you have alumina. And you add the copper to the system because it's generally seen as the active phase. It's on the surface of the copper particle that the chemistry is taking place. This is here that the CO and CO2 is hydrogenated into methanol. So you want a, a nice, large, big area. Then you add the alumina, and you add the alumina to the system in order to decrease, increase the dispersion of your copper particles. So enhance the area, so you have a large area to do the chemistry. But alumina is also acting as a stabilizer during operations, so it's preventing the crystals from sintering, so you will maintain this high area. And uh, then you add the zinc oxide. And again, zinc is increasing the dispersion of your copper even further, maximizing the area. It's also acting as a stabilizer during operation, but then it has this promoting effect. So by adding zinc oxide to the system, you significantly boost the methanol activity. This is very well seen from this uh, picture here, where you have, uh, on the y-axis here, you have the turnover frequency of methanol. This is an intrinsic measure of uh, how many molecules of methanol is produced per active site in the catalyst. And what you can see here is if you go from a pure copper system to a system where you have zinc oxide, then you significantly boost your methanol activity. I'll emphasize that this is uh, on a log scale. So what is really going on? What is the role of the zinc oxide? And this has been debated for decades. And among the theories is, uh, is the emergence of a partially reduced zinc oxide overlayer on these copper particles. This is claimed here, you see the copper crystal and you have some overlay feature here which is claimed to be zinc oxide. So this is claimed to have some special chemical properties. We have seen that if you put copper on a zinc particle and you expose it to different reducing condition and oxidizing conditions, we see that the particles can, cha can change shape. So you also have some morphology going on here. So is this really the what is going on? Or last but definitely not least, it has been proposed that zinc and copper can uh, surface alloy. Um, there's a theoretic study where you can go from CO2 and hydrogen to methanol here. And if you have pure copper, it's uh, following the black route here. And if you have a copper and zinc surface alloy, you will follow the red route here. So you can really see that putting zinc in the surface lowers the energy barrier from going from CO2 to methanol. So this is actually also what we found to be the case. So I'll turn the clock back to 2014. And here we did some initial research where we, for the first time, saw experimental evidence of the emergence of this copper and zinc surface alloy. This work, we couldn't do that alone, so this was done in a collaboration between uh, the Technical University of Denmark and, uh, and the research facilities at Heldertropsø. So what did we do? We took a quite uh, unique approach here, so we, we combined some classical ultra-high vacuum science, surface science, with the, the ability to quantify a larger amount of catalyst in, uh, in fixed bed reactors. So we could take the industrial type methanol catalyst, we could load it into a combined ultra-high vacuum, which has a high pressure cell attached, and we could load it in a fixed bed reactor in Heldertopsøy. Then we could uh, submerge the system to identical treatments in hydrogen, and then we could do some different characterizations afterwards. So among the different characterizations which we had uh, available is the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, or the XPS. We had uh, temperature programmed desorption of hydrogen. And then we have the reactive frontal chromatography by nitrous oxide. 
in the ultra high vacuum systems, we had this um, X ray photoelectron spectroscopy method available, and this is a very surface sensitive method. So, what we did was that we took the, uh, the catalyst, we crushed it, and we re pelletized it into some small disc shaped um, pellets. These we could load in a special sample holder and mount it in the high pressure cell and then transform transfer it into the ultra high vacuum system. Here we could uh, illuminate the surface with X-rays. These X-rays will interact with the, the catalyst and emit electrons, but only electrons from the outermost surface of the catalyst will be, uh, will be collected by the analyzer. So uh, based on the energy of these electrons, we can get a spectrum like this. And uh, this spectrum contains some chemical information about the elements in the catalyst and also around the, about the chemical environment that these different elements are sitting in. So by, uh, by analyzing these spectrums, we can actually distinguish if zinc oxide or if zinc is sitting next to an oxygen atom or if it's sitting next to another uh, zinc atom or, in, if, or said in a different word, we can see if, if it's an oxide or if it's a, if it's a metal metal bond. So here are two, uh, some of the results. This is a real spectrum, and as you can see here, it contains different features and peaks. And uh, our analysis, we focused on the zinc LMM Oshe peak in this, uh, in this spectrum. As uh, here, it's possible to quantify the relative fraction of metal zinc in the, in the surface of the catalyst. As uh, if zinc undergoes reduction from zinc oxide to zinc, we will see a 3 EV downward shift in binding energy. So actually by looking at this peak and deconvoluting it, we can see a contribution from zinc oxide and from metallic zinc. So this we can very easily see as a shoulder feature on, on this particular peak. So here, so what we did was that we took the catalyst, we did some different pretreatments in different partial pressures of hydrogen, and then we can do this sort of analysis afterwards. So initially we have the oxidized catalyst, and then we gradually increase the partial pressure during the pretreatment and before the characterization. And what you can see here, very clearly, that you can see that this shoulder feature is, uh, is rising up. So this is uh, seen in another way here, where we have the amount of, or the relative fraction of reduced zinc in the surface as a function of the hydrogen partial pressure during the pretreatment. In the fixed bed reactor system, we had some chemisorption uh, methods available, and these methods are really good at probing the exposed um, copper surface area, so they can give you a measure of the, of the surface area of your catalyst, but only the surface area which is exposed to the gas phase. And among the different tools we had available was the temperature program desorption of hydrogen. So here, you come along with a probe molecule, it's hydrogen, you can saturate your copper surface with the hydrogen, then you shift to another gas and you flush away all the residual hydrogen, then you increase the temperature in a linear ramping and the hydrogen will recombine and desorb and you'll get a spectrum like this. The area under the curve will be um, will be proportional to your copper surface area. Similarly, we had a nitrous oxide reactor frontal chromatography experiment, which is, is similar, but it's slightly different. It's a flow experiment. So you come along with nitrous oxide, then you react it with your metallic copper surface to form a copper oxide and a nitrogen molecule. And this process can continue as long as you have the metallic copper present in the catalyst, and at some point there is no more copper, and you have a breakthrough of nitrous oxide. So here is a here is a, a profile. So initially, you have um, nitrous oxide here. Here the reactor is bypassed in this part. You have nitrous oxide and nitrogen, and then as soon as you open into your reactor, you have nitrogen coming and nitrous oxide disappearing. And at some point, when you have no more area left to do the this reaction you have a nitrous oxide breakthrough here. So based on the amount of consumed nitrous oxide, you can calculate the amount of copper in the catalyst surface. 
So we have two individual uh, independent ways of characterizing the surface. So here to the results. Here on the y-axis we have the specific surface area or the copper surface area. And here we have again the partial pressure of hydrogen during the pretreatment. And what you can see here is the hydrogen TPD data. So initially we had a nice big hydrogen TPD profile which is associated with a high area. But if we pretreated the catalyst in pure hydrogen, we saw that this hydrogen TPD decreased quite substantially. So uh, this we can uh, this we can see here that the that the copper area is actually decreasing. So this is quite peculiar. This is this it's the same catalyst, and it's not time on stream effects because the catalyst is reloaded in between all the experiments. So what is really going on here? If we, on the other hand, look with the nitrous oxide, we see something completely different, or actually the, actually the opposite phenomena. So initially, we see here, we see a front duration of around 4.5 minutes. And if we go to the pure hydrogen case, or one bar of hydrogen here, we see that this front duration has actually extended. So how can we interpret this? This actually fits exactly with zinc being incorporated into the surface of the particles. So you can say, why this factor of two? Why is the area, why is the area increasing? And in order to explain that, we really need to go into the details with how this area is derived, because it's based on a stoichiometry. So this nitrous oxide measurement, where you have one nitrous oxide molecule reacting with two copper atoms to form a, a copper oxide and a nitrogen. But in the case where you have zinc in the surface, you actually have only one zinc reacting with an oxygen except two ex instead of two copper atoms. So this is really why you have this huge difference here. So uh, by making a, a small geometric model, you can actually compare the results for the two different systems. And uh, here it's converted into a zinc coverage on your copper particles. And here we can see the results for the XPS and the N2O and the hydrogen TPD as a function of the partial pressure of hydrogen. And you can see that all these three independent ways of characterizing the systems are returning essentially the same value. So um, this brings me to a small status before I continue. So I've shown you so far that it's possible to incorporate zinc atoms into the surface of the copper particles. It's uh, actually a relative fast process. This happens just within hours. And it uh, starts occurring already at, uh, at quite mild conditions. So this, of course, brings up some new exciting questions. For instance, what is the zinc coverage during methanol synthesis? And maybe even more importantly, has this, if any, influence on the methanol activity? The latter part has actually been addressed before, or a little more than 20 years ago, by Nakamura and co-workers, where they actually saw a quite, uh, this is the turnover frequency of methanol again, and here you have the zinc coverage on your copper particles, where you see a quite, quite steep increase in your methanol activity at zinc coverage uh, lower than 0.2 monolayers. But uh, this was done on a model catalyst system, so we would like to know how it's behaving in the real industrial methanol catalyst. And these questions were actually what we addressed in the latest science uh, publication, which Eric also mentioned. So I will guide you through our discoveries now. So um, we started out with a model approach and uh, thermodynamically sync can form a copper and zinc bulk alloy in uh, contact with synthesis gas. This can either go through the reaction with CO or through the reaction with hydrogen. So which of these two reaction routes is the dominant one will be determined by kinetics. But uh, we constructed our, our experiment and, and the model so it would follow the CO route here. So the thermodynamic expression of how much zinc you can dissolve in your copper particles thermodynamically is given by this expression. Uh, don't worry, I won't go into detail with how it's derived today, but uh, I'll point your attention to this term here, which contains the CO and CO2 ratio. So this can be used as a descriptor for the reduction potential of the synthesis gas, so to speak. 
So here in this plot, you see the CO and CO2 ratio, or the reduction potential of your synthesis gas. And here you have how much zinc you can dissolve in your copper particles. The next question is, of course, what will happen with the zinc once it's inside the copper? Zinc in the, in the bulk of the copper particles will be in equilibrium with zinc on the outside of your copper particles. And by knowing the segregation energies of, uh, of zinc to the surface, you can calculate the zinc coverage based on the reduction potential. So how can you calculate the, um, the segregation energies? We did that by means of density functional theory. And uh, such a nanoparticle has a lot of different sites. So we needed to calculate the segregation energies to all these different sites. So the segregation energies are converted into a zinc coverage on the abundant copper 111 terasite. Looks like this. So initially, it's growing quite fast. But then it seems to stabilize at higher, uh, at higher reduction potentials. If you go to the more open copper 100 surface, it's slightly higher, but it seems to follow the same trend. And if you go to the edge side, it's even higher, but again, it's following the same trend. And the very undercoordinated corner sites, this is where the sink would really like to go initially, so it has a really high coverage. But, how would, but, but of course, we need to model a, a real nanoparticle. So we took this idealized shape of a kubu octahedron, and then we, it has a very distinct uh, ratio between all these types of surface sites. So we can really calculate how it would look on such a nanoparticle. And it's only slightly higher than the copper 111 surface. So now we actually have a model where we can model how much zinc you will have in the surface of your copper particles as a function of the reduction potential of your synthesis gas, or the CO CO2 uh, ratio. But this is only a model. Of course, it needs to be verified. So uh, we took an experimental approach. So by means of these chemisorption measurements I showed you before, it's actually possible to measure the zinc coverage directly uh, of, of the system after exposing it to different gas atmospheres. So here you see all the results. The solid line and the dashed lines is the model data from before for two different temperatures. And all the spheres is all the experimental values where the catalyst system has been exposed to CO and CO2 ratios, uh, different gas environments with different CO and CO2 ratios, but also hydrogen and water has been used, and also real synthesis gas. And if we look at the 220 case here, then you, you don't consider the red dots here, then you can really see that all the experimental values are aligning very nicely with the model. So this really tells us that the physical principle behind this model is in fact correct. So now we actually have a, an approved model for, uh, for seeing how much zinc you will have in your copper surface uh, as a function of your reduction potential. But uh, then there was the question about the methanol activity. So we did another series of experiments. And here we could uh, pre-treat the catalyst in different partial pressures of hydrogen, like I showed you in the beginning. And afterwards we could, uh, we could perform methanol synthesis. So we pre-treated the system yeah, in various partial pressures and tested the methanol activity in uh, temperatures between 90 and 140 degrees. So this is, real, this is the raw data. So on your left y-axis here, we have the amount of methanol produced. On the right y-axis, we have the temperature, which is associated with this staircase profile. And here you have the time. And you can really see that when you go from the case here where you have the pretreatment in a dilute concentration of hydrogen to where you really uh, where you treat it in, in a lot of hydrogen, you see a huge difference in the methanol activity. So we benchmarked it at this plateau here at 130 degrees on the way down. And afterwards we could actually directly measure the sink coverage in the surface. So we can link this together. And you get a plot like this. So here you have the relative methanol activity as a function of the sink coverage on your particles. And what you can see here is there is a very strong correlation again. And you can see that for low coverages, it seems to be almost linear. 
and it seems to level off when you approach half a monolayer. So now we actually know that this is, uh, or we can see that, that having zinc in the surface of your copper particles is really a key descriptor to understand and improve your methanol activity. So we can go one step back. So if you recall this thermodynamic model, it did not only contain a therm with the CO and CO2, CO and CO2 ratio, but also some of the physical characteristics of the catalyst system, like the zinc oxide particle size. So we can do some exciting stuff now. So we can combine this uh, model with the, with the second order polynomial fit of the relationship between the zinc coverage and the methanol activity. And then we can try to predict how the methanol activity will be impacted by changing some of these fundamental characteristics. So this is what is shown here. On the left y-axis, you have the zinc coverage on your copper particles. And on the right y-axis, you have the relative turnover frequency of methanol. And here on your x-axis, you have uh, the zinc oxide particle size. So this has nothing to do with the copper, which I told you is the active phase initially, or at least it uh, it's, it's has secondary something to do with copper, you can say. But what you can see here, and what is really exciting, that if you decrease the particle size of your zinc oxide particles in the catalyst system, you really seem to boost your methanol activity. So this is really something that by combining this into a, uh, oh, sorry, that combining the, this analysis into one model where we can really describe the, the interaction between the copper and the zinc oxide at the nano level, we can come up with some uh, interesting ways of, uh, of tuning this methanol catalyst system. So uh, this was uh, an example of the scientific work af at which we work in, in uh, Held Autopsy. So this is really an example of how we gain knowledge on, on these catalyst systems. So next, I want to show you what we do after we have some new exciting knowledge and want to put it into work in a real industrial catalyst. But first, a little historical overview. Helder Topso launched its first generation of uh, methanol catalyst in 1986. This is the MK101, and this was a really big step for Topso, for the company, uh, but also the beginning of an era. Later, we launched the second generation in 2000, which is the famous MK121, which some of you might have heard about if you have heard about the methanol industry, um, which was an improved version of the catalyst. And in 2009, we launched the MK151, which is uh, the third generation of methanol catalyst. If we look a little bit, uh, if we look at the reference situation in the world, um, Topsu has currently 47 methanol catalyst references running in uh, all over the world. We have a lot in China, also in the Middle East, in Europe, in the United States, but also in the, also in the South America here. And uh, we have an accumulated production of five five or 50,000 tons per day of, uh, of methanol over a uh, top soil catalyst. In uh, Copenhagen, a little north of, or a little north of Copenhagen, in Raunholm, is the headquarters of top soil located. So this is what you can see here in the picture. And uh, this is also the place where the majority of our research activities is uh, going on. Uh, the R&D facilities are located down here, and this is, uh, this is where we really put our focus on improving the methanol catalyst. We have, um, we have uh, <coughs> some state-of-the-art labs available here, which is very suited for doing the optimization and development of, uh, of new methanol catalysts, but it's also working in close collaboration with our uh, test uh, our production facilities in Frederikssund, also in Denmark, so we can ensure a very high quality and a high standard for our products. But yeah, as I said, these these type of systems is very very suited for doing 
the characterization of and um, doing the uh, do, doing the development and doing the quality control. But uh, if you come up with an idea for a new catalyst, this is not uh, sufficient for just going full scale after this. So we really need to uh, to see how the catalyst is also behaving in a in a real reactor. So in uh, in the northern part of Sweden, in a small town called Peter, we have a demonstration plant available. So here we have three full-scale boiling water reactor tubes, so it's single tube boiling water reactors available for catalyst testing. So here we can really test the catalyst under real industrial conditions. We can do some evaluation of the deactivation up here. We can do that in the lab also, but here we can do it on a longer time scale. So we can evaluate the uh, end of run performance. As I said initially, the catalyst should be running for two, three, or even four years in an in a, in a industrial reactor. And then we also have the opportunity to, um, to really do uh, uh, some byproduct analysis up here. And then we also had the opportunity to test some of the other uh, utilities of such a plant, like, for instance, guard reactors or stuff like that. So uh, when you have tested the catalyst very thoroughly in these type of systems, we're actually ready to go full scale. In Iran, uh, close to the Persian, go the Persian Gulf, is a, a new yeah, mega methanol plant under construction. So this is the margin 5,000 tons per day um, methanol plant. Uh, you can see here in this picture, and this is the construction site, and you can see the location where three huge industrial boiling water reactors, full-scale reactors, are being erected. One of them is already put up, and the other two are yet to be installed in this picture. This uh, particular plant is 100% Topsoe layout, which means that Topsoe has uh, designed the front-end part delivering the synthesis gas, the methanol loop, and also the distillation section. So it's really a mix between technology, catalyst and technical support to make such a such an effort. It's a natural gas based plant. Yeah, it, it has this two step reforming front end and then it has these three huge boiling water reactors. In this picture here you can see the manufacturing process of one of these industrial methanol reactors. Here you can see all the different tubes in the in the reactor so it has really a lot of tubes. And here you see the arrival of, uh, of this industrial full-scale reactor to the margin methanol plant. Topso is delivering more than 2,000 tons of hardware to such a plant and more than 600 tons of catalyst. The situation now is that they are actually currently loading the catalyst in Iran and after that they need to start up all the utility functions around such a plant like ventilation, compressors and stuff like this and actually ready to uh, produce methanol in the end of 2017 or maybe in the beginning of, of uh, next year. So this is really an example of uh, how we can, by studying the fundamental structures of the methanol catalyst, by understanding the system in details, we can really extrapolate and we can produce new and improved methanol catalyst systems, which we can do the right testing and do make the right reactor models and in the end be able to produce these mega methanol plants. Of course, this is a, this is a collaboration with all, between all the different divisions in, in Top Suite to make such an effort. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I've given you an introduction to methanol, to why it's an interesting uh, molecule. I've showed you the characteristic features of the industrial type methanol catalyst. I've given you a very detailed insight into how this copper and zinc interaction is uh, what is really going on. And I've shown you that putting zinc in the surface is really a key descriptor to understand the methanol activity. We can combine this into a, a model where we, for instance, can engineer the activity by tuning the particle size of the zinc oxide. And then I've given you a short introduction to the history and our market position and really see that we, uh, how we can put this knowledge into new products, which in the end can evolve into huge uh, new plans for the industry. 
With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I don't know if we have question, uh, time for questions, otherwise you can find me later on and ask as many questions as you like.